Hi, everybody, and welcome to the live interview with our main guest artist of the year, Dusan Bogdanovic. It's a pleasure to have him again. It's a pity not to be together live in Volterra, but welcome, Dusan, to this little interview. Thank you, Luca. Thank you, Martin. To chat a bit um, about some topics that were quite attractive for students uh, of the last year, and I think that will kind of be interesting for uh, any other guitarist and composer interested in Dushan career and uh, aesthetic in general. Um, we prepared a set of topics, let's say, and the uh, first question that actually is quite spontaneously, uh, that pops up quite spontaneously for um, everybody who talks with him is um, that we know that Dusan is a guitarist, a composer, in a long tradition of guitarists com slash composers, let's say, writing for their own instrument. And uh, a question to start would be, in how far are the guitarist and the composer two distinct facets of your artistry? Or, if better, you do consider them a continuum of the same expression? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's that's certainly a very good question. I mean, actually, I continue them more. Uh, I, I consider them more a, a sort of a continuum. You know, it is more of a continuum. So I don't necessarily separate so much the guitarists from composers. And it just happens that historically there has been more and more division between instrumentalists and composers. But as we all know, originally, um, uh, lots of uh, composers, uh, lute, lute players, let's say Francesco Canova da Milano or John Dowland, you know, they, they had this very much uh, kind of like a collaboration between the two, not to mention uh, great masters like Bach or Mozart. I mean, uh, also in other kinds of music like jazz, or uh, different kinds of ethnic music, uh, the, the connection between the composition and, and the instrument is much stronger. However, I see these days, I think that there's more and more connection between uh, composition and instrument in, in the classical music and in the classical guitar in particular. Of course, um, there is some level of specialization. So, you know, given that, that we can only focus so much being one person at a time, we are kind of like forced to focus more on one thing than on the other. So when I was younger, um, I, I studied both composition and the guitar. And uh, in the beginning, I was more focused on uh, instrument. I was more focused on yeah. being guitarist. And then little by little, I opened that up. I started improvising, I played jazz, etc. And then uh, later on, I kind of established myself more as a composer guitarist. At, at this point, uh, I think I'm perhaps more of a composer than guitarist, but, you know, I still love my instrument. I play concerts, uh, etc. Yeah, indeed, the interesting thing is that today there's, as you said, a growing interest of young players mm -hmm. in both, let's say, getting hyper specialized in their instrument and at the same time trying to to create a parallel i don't, I don't want to say career but at least a parallel um, let's say um, studies in composition and uh it's kind of yes as you say that this disruption to me was very clear when i read for, for the first time your bios in which it was quite clear that you were kind of raising talent as a performer and then you just yeah. said okay it's fine but i'm more interested into composition and then the two things kind of blend together and probably they've always been since your first uh, attempt on playing composing or improvising as you would say but we will right. go back to improvisation because this is a very interesting aspect and um the um, Question, second question, which is strictly related to the first one, is that you, you also said a guitarist composer, but actually you do compose for many other instruments. And I know that often 
in, uh, in your classes there are even pianists or harpists or other musicians kind of other instrumentalists following your composition lesson so um, what specific qualities do you think a guitarist composer can bring into composition for other instruments than guitar and if your ideas for pieces even dedicated to other instruments both on the guitar or on the piano or, or another instrument? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a good question because, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a pianist just to the extent that I can work a little bit on, uh, you know, instrumentation and things mm -hmm. like that, you know, but I mean, obviously I can't, uh, I can't play much of the, the, the piano repertoire. On the other hand, um, as a composer, you're always faced with the structure. You're always faced with uh, you're always uh, uh, faced with instrumentation. You're always faced with uh, with things that are not necessarily just focused on the guitar. Yeah. So um, really, when you are teaching composition to other instrumentalists, such as pianists, I mean, you're more focusing on the composition than necessarily the instrument. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, I had like, uh, for example, for the past two years, I had a Russian uh, pianist, Artem Pergushin, who is really a, an excellent pianist, great improviser, and also very good composer. So we worked uh, more on, on his techniques of improvising, on what kind of uh, rhythmic sort of structures he wants to use in his music. And I was mainly his organizer, so to say. I was kind of like a a manager in a way, you know, I was trying to kind of manage a bit what he is doing. So in that way, um, I think I, I, I'm not sure that my knowledge of the guitar is necessarily all that important. Mm. On the other hand, on the other hand, that class is a composer performer class. So as a composer performer, I had some influence in um, how he developed himself as a composer performer. That is to okay. say, yeah, I wasn't just a composer in, an, in, in a sort of an abstract way. So I had a lot of connection with him as a performer so that we kind of we could organize the way he would structure his concerts, the way he would uh, improvise, etc. It could be anybody else, perhaps any other performer that in that way could influence his performing abilities. However, guitar and piano are very close. So there is that kind of advantage of having some sort of a connection uh, because of the capacity to do counterpoint and harmony, etc. If I was, say, now I'm just going sort of like a bit further into this. Yeah. this say, if I was a, a composer, performer, violinist, a violin player, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that I would have as much to say uh, about that, uh, perhaps just as a performer, the, the psychological aspects and some other aspects of performance. But I think as a guitarist, you know, there was more of a connection with that. Okay. I envisioned this class, which, you know, I'm retiring this year. So <clears throat> that's just, uh, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, because I don't really feel like, like I'm retiring. But okay, this is officially I'm retiring. Um, but I think that, that I can envision this class, performer, composer program, as a program that can really be focused on a lot of different instruments. And there are some places, like say there is CalArts in California, California Institute of the, of the Arts, that has this program developed, but developed in a, in a way uh, with a lot of diversity where there are various performers, different instrumentalists that are doing their compositions. So I think that um, I think that's something where I see uh, uh, really a great future. Personally, I do. You know, one, one thing maybe just to kind of also, you know, just to say this, I mean, I don't think that there is any kind of absolute future or absolute direction. Mm -hmm. What I think is that, you know, just everybody has their own kind of slant, their own focus, their own direction of what, according to their psychological profile, according to their intellectual preferences, uh, what winds up being their path, so to say. 
So in that sense, I mean, I don't think there's anything, um, how shall I say, there's nothing absolute about being a composer performer. I think uh, some people have no interest in composition and that's completely legitimate. <laughs> it's yeah. as legitimate as composers that do, they don't want to perform. So I think it just all depends on what kind of path you find really natural for yourself. And I think that uh, why I was very keen on doing this is just because this is not something that is very much established at this point. If you want to be a composer, there are millions of places where you can go. If you want to be a performer, there are millions of places you have you can go to. If you want to be a performer composer, it's very limited. Yes, indeed. So I think that that's why I think personally, I think this is something very interesting. And on the other hand, certain kinds of music. Now I'm just sort of uh, <coughs> going in my uh, <laughs> in my themes. <laughs> yes. My themes. Great. Okay. What I'm thinking about is, for example, as I mentioned before, being performer composer was uh, not only a possibility, but it was actually uh, an expected role at certain point. Yeah. Say in the Renaissance, in the Baroque time, being a performer composer, you know being an improviser, being an improviser. Everybody was in, improvising to some extent. I'm not saying completely, but how many people do you see today playing, uh, say, Bach, uh, preludes or fugues or anything like that uh, and improvising? Not that many. Maybe in specialized early music circles now, this is becoming more and more common. But in general, you know, you, you're just supposed to come and you play this monumental uh, music by Bach and it's all kind of supposed to be 100% exact and magnificent and great, etc. But, you know, that music actually intrinsically, it has possibility of being uh, improvised, if nothing else, ornaments, let's say. But even that's kind of very sort of timid, you know, just doing ornaments. But doing like variations, themes and variations, uh, improvising forms as they do, um, uh, as the organists, for example, do. I think that's that's all very important. And I wanted to mention that one of my students, uh, Bor Zulian, who is a lute player, uh, when we studied, I worked on guitar primarily with him, but we did one uh, research project on improvising Richard Carr's, improv improvising uh, Fantasia or Richard Carr form. Oh, nice. And so we spent two years working together and, uh, you know, he established, um, um, you know, ways, tactics, uh, how to improvise richer cars. And uh, actually, that's what he does these days. He did a CD recently of Dowland and some of the uh, some of the forms are written out forms. Some are interludes that are completely improvised. So I think, in my opinion, I think this is all very healthy you know again i'm not saying that everybody should be doing it but i think i think it's a it's a nice stretch of imagination and, and work so your statement is actually not only personal and concerning yourself but also teaching and uh, pedagogy in general yes 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 i try i try to make all the you know everything that i'm theoretically thinking i'm trying to make it practically existent because otherwise, I think it just all stays in some realm of uh, books and is just hiding somewhere and collecting yeah. dust, you know. So I think we have to make it live in a way. That's, yeah. that's what I think. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. um, since you're talking about that, we can also go to uh, the question concerning um, the fact that over the years you built your personal, very personal style and quite mm -hmm. immediately identifiable language. So, uh, so. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we, <laughs> we all know that it's like that. And uh, what would you recommend then to a young guitarist who want to kind of develop his own language uh, using the tools coming from the tradition, but going uh, let's say, um, deep into what can be also personal and uh, individual. 
um, for example, I remember that in the symposium that we had a couple of years ago in the Koninklijk Conservatorium in Brussels, and uh, I think you were invited, but it was not the round table you were at. Uh, we had uh, Elliot Fisk, Stephen Goss, uh, Boris Gage, who is a local uh, player, and they um, kind of insisted, for example, on the fact that, uh, and I don't know if you agree with that, not insisted, but they declared that harmony is there. I mean, is there in our Western tradition, and uh, um, it's been used overall from uh, back until, but even from before, from the Renaissance until the the, the last century. And uh, melodies are always there in our system. With the, you, you can, I mean, uh, the exploitation of the modes and of the scales is uh, has been done for so long that the only element of the music in which you can still find new things different from your tradition and uh, um, interesting for your development, it's rhythm. And it's something that I find very connected to um, the fact that, I mean, if you just think of the polyrhythmic studies, for example, or of the fact that you introduce in the for Western um, players all the... Um, um, your own tradition, Serbian, so Yugoslavia, uh, Serbia, and uh, um, polyrhythmics, and um, which is part actually of your uh, compositional and aesthetic uh, theory. So, if you think that rhythm can be something to dig deep in into, and if uh, according to the world music in general or to different music tradition can also be like a, an interesting thing to explore for a young student who is, let's say, at the end of his master career. So he, he has approached from back to Da Milano, to uh, Sor and uh, uh, Rinastera. Voilà. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I mean, the question is, um, who are we talking about? Are you talking about the composer guitarists, or are you talking about performers more, or improvisers? Who are you talking about? I think that we stay in this new category that you mm -hmm. uh, defined, let's say. So the guitarist perf performer, okay. composer performer. Right, say. right. Well, I think these are interesting times. These are very interesting times. Um, of course, I think it's important to study the harmony and actually, apropos this, this, this subject, you know, I'm just having this, this, uh, harmony that I wrote many years ago, maybe eight, eight, seven years ago, I wrote the harmony for classical guitar. And so now I'm just getting an, a, a really good Italian publisher, Curci, and they're publishing this harmony it should be coming out in, in the autumn. So... I think it's very important, of course. Harmony is very important, and even this harmony that I did is is very limited. It really kind of uh, stops around uh, Debussy and Ravel. So that that that's as far as I could go, and it was a lot of work. It's a tremendous amount of work. So I think that all that kind of stuff, you can actually go into any subject like this and go very much in depth and in detail. So, uh, we can talk about the rhythm in particular, but I think any of these aspects, like melodic, harmonic, uh, contrapuntal, um, formal, formal, just the form, just the structuring of the music, and the rhythmic, uh, I mean, these are like tremendous subjects. These are kind of like subjects we can talk about and go into depth forever, you know. Yeah. So... Uh, Yes, I mean, to connect to me, yes, the rhythm has been very important to me. So maybe we can just talk about the rhythm in particular, but I do think that all these other subjects are incredibly important anyway. Um, like, say, you know, you talk about harmony, I mean, you can go in harmony as far as, you know, the area where the extended tonality touches atonal music. So yeah. this whole area, this is like a huge area. Not to mention like the modal thinking or the polymodality. 
pentatonic and various other kind of, I mean, harmony is just like an inexhaustible source. But okay, let's just kind of stop and go back to the rhythm. So no, no, for me you can go on. Uh, it is no right. problem at all because yeah, you're right. some you're questions right. are, yeah. may, are asked just to be against them. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, to, be, right. to have another view. So, so, so right. fascinating yeah. that maybe is that different for guitar players? You think, Dusan, and for our repertoire, that certain harmonic idioms have been discovered less, or is it just because it's true that I mean, we have seen a lot of evolutions in all directions in harmony, but. Historically, it's also true that it's not always followed just as fast in our instrument because, I mean, many things seem to come just a little bit after the mainstream introduction of certain phenomena as well. Mm -hmm. you, you meant in general, you mean for all musicians at this point, this kind of in-depth study is still, and then the putting into practice. Yeah, yeah, okay. You're right. I meant it kind of very generalized, but, but if we're talking just about guitar, Yes, I think gu guitar is a bit kind of behind the fact, you know, we're a little bit slow, we're a little bit slow. However, in certain areas, we're much faster than other classical areas. So, for example, joining jazz, um, uh, rock, improvisation, etc., we are much more advanced, you could say advanced, uh, than the other instruments, uh, especially instruments that are kind of very much connected to the classical tradition. So, yes, I mean, in guitar repertoire, there is, talking just of harmony, there is a huge variety of, um, you know, from modal thinking uh, in, in, again, I'm coming back to Canova da Milano, one of my favorite composers, uh, so Canova da Milano to Bach and further on, um, soar to, say, uh, romantic harmony of, I don't know, um, there are so many great, you know, great sort of harmonic uh, compos composers that use harmony really well. Um, so I think there is a lot to learn about harmony. And then there is kind of more contemporary harmony, like you mentioned the Walton before, say, like Walton or... or uh, even like more modern composers that are not harmonically defined the same, like say Elliot Carter with changes. So there's a huge amount of things to talk about. But perhaps perhaps we should come back to the rhythm. <laughs> because yeah. I think that's where we started. So my interest in rhythm has been um, maybe to some extent, uh, I've had... A lot of interest in rhythm because I do come from uh, from that area, from the Balkan area, where the asymmetric meters, the odd meter, is very common. So that's already something that's kind of a bit strange, quote unquote, strange for the Western ears. And so I remember, like some of the earlier compositions that I did were in odd meter. You know, like one one piece I wrote for piano. Actually, I remember now, it was like in five eight. So that was in 5.8. So I used these, you know, the, the odd meter very much. And then little by little, I got uh, interested in other sort of rhythmic music. So uh, from jazz, my interest in jazz, uh, I went into um, interest in African music. So in African music, rhythm is just absolutely... Uh, <clears throat> um, absolutely uh, important and, and magnificent. So anyway, actually my interest in polyrhythm was more connected with African music than it was necessarily with the Balkan music. There aren't really, I mean, at least to my knowledge, there's not that, that much polyrhythm in Balkan music. There's much more polyrhythmic thinking in African music or um, say some other Middle Eastern areas. Um, so, so my interest in, in polyrhythm comes more from, uh, from African music. Then um, I started developing this series of polymetric or polyrhythmic exercises. And this was something that was just an interest of my own. Um, I just found it fascinating to be able to subdivide in different ways the same kind of uh, patterns. So say, um, one meter that is very typical for the Balkans is is nine, which consists of two, 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 three. So, 
another pattern of the nine, which is regular, is three, three, three. So that's one, two, three, 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 one. So there is a different subdivision. So you can have pound, 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 taka, 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 so I've been very much interested in these kinds of things, and uh, uh, much of my music is is rhythmically based on these sort of patterns. Um, for example, there is my Sevdalinka, uh, which is written for two guitars and a string quartet, and and this one is based on uh, fifteen. So, for example, this one has like a three times five and five times three. So it's kind of like mathematically, it seems very sort of abstract, but not really, you know. So, for example, this is one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, right? Yeah. Or one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Yeah. So it's, again, these kind of subdivisions, and I find those kind of very natural, actually. I find these things very natural and not very abstract. Uh, but yeah, that has been my my great interest. And then then eventually I discovered that Ligeti has written this great uh, rhythmic studies, not just the studies for piano. And I discovered that you know, uh, I mean, he's done like an incredible. This is an incredible rhythmic and, and, and compositional feat. But I was actually surprised because I didn't know about this this sort of uh, that anybody else was doing this. So you know. Yeah. Anyway, it was just kind of, it's just very interesting, you know, that at, at the same time, you, know, you you find, you know, you find lots of things, sometimes things that you're interested, suddenly you discover that there are many other things that's been going on um, that are kind of going along the similar lines. And also polyrhythm, polymeter um, has been a lot um, used in, um, has been a lot used in jazz, uh, in improvised music, and actually, I was just looking a little bit earlier this morning about the the metric modulation, metric modulation, which is a fact of uh, taking the same sort of a pattern and just giving it, uh, giving it a different uh, metric profile, so to say. Mm -hmm. And I, I just noticed that there was uh, in this evolution of of the metric modulation, there was, for example, uh, uh, one piece by Miles Davis called Footprints, which already has been using this this kind of um, this kind of pattern. So, so it, it's fascinating. These these kinds of subjects are completely fascinating. You can spend your whole life just um, you know just focusing on one area, just going into details or any one of these areas. How's that? <laughs> yeah, that's great. I was just thinking of footprint and legate that you mentioned and actually the thing of it's just just music is enjoyable music i mean it's not music that you have to be there and follow and even there are unexpected aspects or modu rhythmic modulation it just feels natural and well, you know, it's, yeah, I, I think it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, most of these things that I've been interested in are not really uh, theoretical. Uh, what I mean is, yes, they are theoretical to some extent, but I have a real fondness. I mean, I really like, for example, these polyrhythmic patterns. Yeah. They really, I find them very exciting because they're intellectually and physically and emotionally very stimulating. It's very interesting stuff. Yeah. And uh, when I studied composition, I was much more involved with uh, so-called avant-garde uh, music at that point. And um, I was sort of writing serial music, and then I, I went away from that, and I sort of went in this direction of, uh, you know, coming back to, to, to sort of a, uh, <clears throat> to ethnic or folk music, to the world folklore in a way. And, and I had this interest in, in African music and back in Balkan music, Indian music. So I found that actually extremely interesting and also, um, how shall I say, much more integrated with the, with the human as we are. It's not just intellectual, it's not just 
physical or just emotional. It actually integrates the human on all the levels. And that's what I see as, as something that I'm interested in primarily. That's why I think these things, if you take them out of context, say polyrhythms, then they, they seem very kind of abstract and dry. But if it's in the right context, you know, it's, it's emotionally very satisfying. It's very interesting. It's rhythmically very, uh, very exciting. And uh, I think that's, that's how I, I would look at all this stuff. And then coming back to your your process beyond the performer composer, it's actually interesting. So so some things that I, something attires your attention, and we were also wondering, Luca and I, when we prepared these questions, oh. how does your work end up on the paper in the end? Is it something that you are on your lap with a guitar and experimenting with a, for instance, a polymetrical idea in which then a, a melody appears? Or we were very interested to see. In, in, in which order these things come? Or do you sit down at the table and write from your mind, from your imagination, and then see what is possible on an instrument? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, when I was younger, I, I used to play everything on guitar. I played everything. I composed on the guitar. and uh, But then, uh, little by little, I found that it's kind of problematic if you always compose with, with a guitar because you wind up doing lots of cliches. You know, you're always doing what's under your fingers, and then sometimes the composition suffers, so to say, you know. Um, so these days, I kind of more, um, I just uh, more use piano, actually. Piano seems to be more my, my instrument of choice, you know. I use piano, but then I always check with the guitar just to make sure if I'm writing for a guitar, because sometimes I write things that are really kind of very difficult and that I myself have really trouble uh, playing it, you know. So I'm usually thinking if I have trouble playing it, then, you know, you know I probably should do something easier. It's a relief to hear you have trouble as well. I think many will be happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have trouble with my, with my composition. I have probably more trouble than with lots of other stuff. So I think that... Um, one great thing about being composer performer is that you are always in contact with the instrument. So even if I write it on, say on piano, I still, you know, I know what the instrument is like. I always check with the instrument. So it's never really, um, again, to say it's never really something purely theoretical or abstract. I think it's very important to be kind of, to, to live with this music and to live with the instrument, to live with the sounds. You know, if you're writing for flute or you're writing for cello. Um, I mean, I bought a violin, you know, at some point because I just wanted to kind of really, um, yeah, just to see how my, my father played violin. So I have some idea of, of it, but nevertheless, you know, um, then for the cello, I didn't buy a cello, <laughs> but uh, I would tune the guitar as a violoncello. You know, CGDA, like an octave, uh, well, actually an octave lower. So anyway, these were, uh, you know, so that's how I feel that I stay in the contact with the instruments themselves. Um, as far as writing, you know, that's, that's sort of a different question. Like I said, I do use piano quite a lot, and this is because piano is um, easier. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of strange to say, but piano is a lot easier than guitar. Guitar is a very, very difficult instrument. Uh, and that's why, you know, the composers have really traditionally sort of avoided guitar, you know. I remember that uh, David Tannenbaum told me that he was hassling Ligeti. He was running after him. Well, maybe he wasn't running after him, but he really wanted Ligeti to write for guitar. And Ligeti said, no, I can't do that. It's just such a... It's such a difficult instrument to write for, you know. And then, of course, we know that famous story about Julian Bream uh, and, and, and Stravinsky. And so it is, it is a very idiosyncratic instrument. It's a very, very difficult instrument to write for. And I actually uh, come across this all the time. I've been just writing recently a piece for, for a really great guitarist, a friend of mine, Mike Kudirka. Um, who, who can play like almost anything. And anyway, I wrote these two blues meditations and they're like uh, three voice contrapuntal pieces. And, and, and 
if I wrote this for piano or let's say for three different instruments, I would have written it like, you know, like in not in five minutes, but extremely quickly. Writing it for guitar took me forever because not only do you have to have the, the lines kind of go according to their logic and to according to your intuitive feeling, you know, because you have you have to follow your intuition. But at the same time, it has to follow this unfortunate kind of limitations of registers in the guitar. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you are having, a, I don't know, if you're having some higher line in higher register, I mean, you know, you just cannot have independent line in the bass. It's just impossible. It's very difficult to do it because then you have to stretch your fingers like say, you're doing a line up here and then you need a bass, E, F, G or something. It's impossible to do. I mean, as we know, we know this from uh, transcribing Bach or other things. Um, but that's, that is really tough. It's very tough. Guitar is a very tough instrument uh, to, to write for. On the other hand, there are beautiful things uh, on guitar that is just like irreplaceable. You know, it's, it's like this miniature kind of piano you know that that you can you can vibrate. You can have this campanella, these beautiful campanella sounds. Um, there are lots of things that are so so fantastic about guitar that uh, you know you cannot replace it by any other instrument. Yeah. Um, so as usual, you know there's a plus and there's a minus. A minus. Yeah. So, uh, but I do think that if you kind of just go with cliches on the guitar it sort of winds up like a cliche also, you know. What I mean is, there's so much guitar music that based on arpeggio, for example. It's like unavoidable, you know, you have just these millions of, of tunes and compositions, and they're all arpeggios, you know. So that's kind of like really unfortunate, you know, in a, in a way, um, because I think for me, to come back to the rhythm, as important as rhythm is counterpoint. Counterpoint is is incredibly important because it gives you like um, it gives you uh, independence of lines and every line is sort of like self-conscious, so to say. I mean, for me, that's how I write. So every line has its own logic and has to go where it wants to go naturally. And at the same time, you have the vertical. Uh, you know, coinciding of the lines, etc. So I think counterpoint is really, really uh, very important. So I would say, I mean, sure, you know, I mean, it's okay, you know, like everybody has to start somewhere. I mean, so yeah, start with arpeggios, play the chords, you know, melody with chords, etc. But at some point, I would advise every uh, would-be uh, composer performer to study counterpoint, study. Uh, Renaissance counterpoint study, uh, Baroque and further on. And uh, again, as I wrote this book on harmony, I wrote this book on counterpoint as well, which which is now also with Kurci, actually, because they bought Berben. It was published yeah. with Berben, but now Kurci bought Berben. So, so both of these books will be uh, with them. And uh, my study of counterpoint was essentially a Renaissance Palestrina counter counterpoint. And I actually planned to do a whole book on Baroque counterpoint. <laughs> I just ran out of energy. I just wrote this. It was just, just writing this, you know, the, the Renaissance counterpoint was a huge amount of work. And, uh, you know, uh, you have to go through the study of the species, different species. Then you go to the study of imitations, the modes. The, there's so much stuff to do. Um, I also have great affinity for Renaissance music, of course. Yeah. It's, it's, it links also very nicely to, to oh. another thing he noticed reading. Um, I'm here, will know. Yeah, that is that um, it's true that, that watching your repertoire and also reading how you talk about it, that the nature of your music is, is uh, seems to be a melting pot of that Renaissance counterpoint polyrhythmic textures from Belgian music, but also African music, as you mentioned, right. then uh, jazz yeah. idioms. And so we were actually, I mean, it's a fascinating mix, let's say it's quite a unique mix, as, as Luca pointed out also earlier. And um, 
that's often a nice thing in music then to see how many similarities there are or at least how many similar aspects there are and um, we were wondering that very probably again the improvisation comes back into the game in that is that something you might maybe want to elaborate on as well so there's these three extremely different geographical points but also in time and evolutions um, Maybe it's interesting to hear even how you got in touch with those and then right. brought okay. them together in your mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, improvisation has been um, something I've always been interested in. And uh, when, I was, uh, when I was a teenager, um, I improvised a lot. And perhaps, you know, when I think about it, perhaps one of the reasons is, is that I played a lot of music together with my father. As I said, he played violin. He also played, he wasn't a musician. He was professor of physics. He taught physics, you know, so he wasn't a musician. But as a musician, as an amateur musician, he played violin, guitar, and mandolin. <laughs> so I played with him when I was a kid. Uh, I played with him like guitar, two guitar duos, I also learned how to play mandolin, so sometimes we would play like Leopold Mozart uh, duos, um, you know, and, and things like that. And at the same time, when the Beatles came in, he bought me like the Beatles records. So we played Beatles tunes, and then we played like uh, jazz standards. And so actually my background, I guess, was kind of naturally encompassing all these areas. And then when I was a teenager, I was sort of like divided somewhat between the classical music, playing bossa nova, and then playing in an electric guitar band. So, uh, so uh, you know, so it's actually, it's not something unnatural for me. I had like, this was my background really in all this. And uh, of course, I mean, a lot of this stuff, I improvised a lot. And uh, uh, this this uh, electric guitar band we primarily played um, R and B R and B like uh, you know really liked a lot uh, Aretha Franklin Sam and Dave in those days um, you know um, and uh, James Brown of course so anyway uh, I improvised quite a lot of that and um, then later on after I finished my studies in Geneva. I, um, when I went to the United States, that was in 1980, I went to uh, Los Angeles, I lived there, I joined a lot of jazz musicians, and for a while I actually abandoned classical guitar, I just didn't even think I would play classical music again. So it took me maybe, it's true, it took me like maybe four or five years, and I just played a lot with really some excellent jazz musicians. Uh, Mil Cholevia, this, this great friend of mine, a Bulgarian uh, composer, pianist, uh, James Newton, flutist, Charlie Hayden, who, who, who has died meanwhile, but this great um, you know, bass player. So anyway, I, I, I played quite a lot. I played in jazz clubs, some standards, but more going in the direction of sort of like a, sort of like a fusion of ethnic music and um, and uh, jazz, some classical. That's where I had this idea of writing jazz sonata, because I came from the background of the classical background, but at the same time, improvise. So um, also played a little bit with uh, with some um, Indian musicians, but not not that much. In any case. Uh, it was a very interesting period of my life, very open. And then little by little, I came back into the classical uh, environment and I tried to somehow put it all together. I tried to integrate everything. So that's really why at this point and for, for quite a long, long time, why I have these influences uh, all integrated uh, together. But I wanted to mention something. I don't know if this is... a uh, if this is a good advice, but I would say that the most important thing is just to really follow your kind of uh, intuition and follow your um, your directions. You know, whatever you feel is it really that where your where your uh, passion and where your main interest lies. I mean, that's really the key to everything. I mean, are you going to kind of get interested in, um, in music of uh, pygmies or, uh, or not? I mean, that's kind of besides the point, you know. If you are, 
then that's even better, of course. Um, so I would say that all these interests that I had, I mean, they didn't come uh, out of my, how shall I say, I wasn't trying to manufacture something. I wasn't trying to manufacture a career. I wasn't trying to come up with a persona of some sort. That's just who I am. That's that's really, <laughs> these are my interests. You know, this and as a person, this is what kind of person I am. So I, I would just say, just follow your, your direction. I think that's kind of the most important thing. And just to kind of follow, uh, you know, like particularly interesting things. Yeah, that's very nice. Sure, if you have some kind of interest in that. But I think it's much more important to follow your passion and your, your real, your authentic interest. So that would be some kind of, uh, some kind of advice. Anyway, that's what I did. So yeah. Yeah. And so then you have been in America, you have been playing with jazz musicians, with Indian musicians, you have taken jazz, the Beatles, and then Auntie Goni Goni comes, <laughs> <laughs> and she brings into your life. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. These hymn to the muse that uh, Luca and I have had the pleasure of, of living from very close in a way, when Antigone was studying it, when she yes. performed it, um, both in the in the solo guitar version and meanwhile also in a in a arrangement that you right. did yourself huh, for guitar, alto wrote, and cello? I wrote the arrangement, yeah, yeah, I wrote the arrangement, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is again a completely different story because there you have worked with material of over 2,000 years old and again we were <laughs> very curious. Yeah, no, yes. just, Right. So how you would okay. affront something like that, because that, that goes way beyond Renaissance uh, polyphony. I mean, that is into right. the mystery of lost music. Right. It's true. It's true. Well, you know, this is something that I really like doing. I mean, um, what I really like doing, I like composing. I mean, I like putting things together. It just makes me happy to put things together. Uh, and I have a, a kind of very curious and open personality in that way. So um, I have to admit that uh, before this, before this piece, I, I never studied much uh, antique Greek music. No, I, I, I knew some uh, of the sort of like Greek folk music, say Theodorakis, I knew Maria Faranturi and like more like popular songs and uh, ethnic Greek music. But then once I started doing this piece, I um, spent quite long time, actually, I would say maybe four or five months, I was actually studying. I was actually studying antique Greek music because I didn't want to do just something kind of disconnected. You know, now you're doing antique Greek music, so just some arbitrary <laughs> sort of. So I wanted to really know about the subject. And uh, and so, as I said before, I mean, I get very involved sometimes in a certain subject. I go in a lot of depth and detail. So I got these books. I, I got a, a book by West uh, that's, that's, I think is a British writer about the antique uh, Greek music. And then I connected with a person that teaches antique Greek music in Vienna, at the Academy in Vienna. And so, I got various uh, literature on antique Greek music. I learned about uh, about the modes, modes of the Greek music, about the system of, of uh, trichords. There are like trichords. A lot of music is based on trichords. Um, about like modulations. There's also modulation about different kinds of uh, different kinds of types of uh, trichords and tetrachords. Uh, microtonality, which I didn't use. I mean, I kind of wish I would have used it, but okay, I didn't use that. Um, and then uh, I started studying the literature. I was thinking, what do I do now? So I just started looking at the fragments because they're only fragments. There's nothing really uh, apart from the fragments. And so I found Mesomedes came to the muse. Um, I found uh, some some other uh, music that's pretty well known, like say uh, Seikilos, Epitaph to Seikilos. That's supposedly, I presume, that's true. They, they say this is the first written uh, music document. Uh, and then Limenios, Limenios uh, was was a writer of the of the Delphic hymns of Apollo. So I studied these things. I looked through them, and I found what what could speak to me, 
you know, that's coming always to the same thing. It's like, what, what makes you feel passionate? What, what makes you feel interested? So I found this music uh, uh, very beautiful, very interesting. And um, uh, I, like I said before, I studied also like the technique on how the, the ancient Greek music is, is built. And so I took every piece and I kind of deconstructed it. So I try to understand every piece exactly how it's built, on which modes, etc. And so I kind of, in a way, how shall I say, I was kind of like a, uh, kind of like an archaeologist. I was an archaeologist, but who took the old material and kind of tried to revive it. It was sort of like a, um, I don't know, sort of like like these movies about the dinosaurs that were reconstructed by having <laughs> by having just like little cells, little fossils. So that was kind of in a way similar. I had these little fossils of these fragments of the of the Greek music, and I tried to reconstruct some contemporary kind of dinosaurs out of it. Um, of course, I mean this is contemporary ancient Greek music. I mean it could not be anything else. Um, Meanwhile, I listened to some uh, uh, to some interpretations of this music, and it's really kind of tricky. It's very tricky. I listened to some of the uh, pieces, and uh, for example, I found that some of the metric interpretations were different, and uh, that was some of the problem of interpreting asymmetric meter in old music. And in the beginning, uh, you know, like uh, like. Um, music that was, say, rhythmically in 5-8, it would be interpreted as in 6-8 or 3-4, because that was more comfortable to the Western ears. However, it's been some time already that this meter has been understood. Uh, but anyway, I, I, that's how I approach this. And then uh, also there was a question of the guitar. What do you do with the guitar in this case? And I did think that maybe uh, old instruments like uh, lira and and um, kitara were maybe some kind of uh, some model because they're very much related to our instrument. They're very much related to guitar. And so in this case, I did use more <laughs> arpeggios than usual. <laughs> um, in any case, you know the form, the form and the language out of these pieces comes really out of the fragments themselves. I mean, I I just kind of let it develop on its own. That's basically what I did. I would deconstruct the music so I understand how it's built, and then I would just let it develop in whatever way it wanted to be developed. And maybe that's something that I would say that's kind of, that's really typical for what I do. I just let it be what it wants to be. I would say that's perhaps... And then, um, you know, it just it just winds up being what it wants to be. I try not to interfere, but more kind of, I'm more like a helper, I feel. And the music develops on its own, the lines go certain ways, and I try not to, uh, not to interrupt the flow, I would say. And then, you know, when you need, of course, you come up with problems every now and then, when there are, there is a problem, then you come there and you just kind of help, uh, you know, solve the problem. Um, Antigone played so beautifully this music, you know, I'm just so happy with what she did. I mean, her recording of this. And also, I wrote this um, arrangement for, uh, for violin, uh, violin, uh, guitar and cello, and another one for flute instead of violin. I always make these lots of different arrangements. And anyway, I, I just, I love this arrangement. I think it's, I think what, what uh, Antigone did with her trio, I think is just, just fantastic. In a way, even uh, a little bit better than solo guitar because you can hear the lines separately. And, uh, you know, it's always hard with the guitar, um, not not to complain again, but it's hard to hear all the lines when there are like several lines going on. So when you have separate instruments, I think it's all very transparent. In any case, um, yeah, I'm very happy with this with this music. I'm very happy with the recordings, and um, I'm up for more antique Greek music. You know, if if it comes uh, if it comes my way, how's that?
<laughs> Let's hope it does. Huh? Great. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if this explained this explained the bit. Absolutely, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. It's also very interesting to hear how you indeed took the time to study just for the writing of one piece and did an analysis to actually come to, yeah, a composition. And the, the letting it flow is something I think is, is really feelable also in the end result that when we heard it for the first time, we absolutely had no clue what to expect. I only knew for myself the Cyclos tune. tune. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, right. And, uh, and actually, it's, it's a very magical experience eh, to just uh, mm. sail along on that flow. So it's, um, it's something that I think is also an experience of part of the experience of, of, of the listener in the end. So uh, well, I'm happy to hear that. Sure. Yeah. It's great. That's absolutely great. wonderful. Mm -hmm. More? I think that since you, so we can also kind of a little bit change topic. Let's say you were talking about also the interesting thing of arranging, you know? Like you say, this, even your own composition, uh, okay, into the muse, but mm. then arranged on different ensembles can give a bigger, uh, let's say, or a better view on really how the line evolves and uh, how uh, the interaction between the voices happen. So, mm -hmm. would you consider kind of, I'm mean, talking always uh, by the point of view of someone who doesn't have a lot of experience mm -hmm. and a lot of, you know, developed uh, hands in doing that, but would you say that arranging music can also be a kind of a training for composition or better for, especially mm -hmm. for counterpoint as, as you were figuring out and telling before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, was it kind of a preliminary step towards composition when you were younger, as you said, together with improvisation? Well, you know, ar arranging is, it's, it's a great thing to do, of course. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting to, to do. Um, um, I studied orchestration when I studied composition. I also studied orchestration and I studied, uh, uh, we did, uh, say, orchestration of Debussy Preludes, you know, make it for symphonic orchestra from the piano. We studied a lot the piano reduction, uh, piano reduction, uh, orchestration of Ravel, of the original piano piece by Mussorgsky, the, the uh, pictures of, at, at that exhibition. And... Um, um, I can't say that, that for me, orchestration was a way towards composition. I think for me, orchestration was more kind of uh, stretching my composition in different areas, in different colors, different uh, um, how, how to really uh, understand composition as being able to kind of divide the voices and kind of stretch them uh, uh, across different areas. So it's kind of like intellectual gymnastics to some extent. And it's also kind of emotionally, it's very interesting because you're changing instrumentation. You have very different character of, of the instruments. Um, but uh, yeah, I think arranging is, I mean, I've arranged a lot of things, especially in my music, I've arranged a tremendous amount of stuff. Um, I like arranging just in itself. I think it's, it's a very satisfying thing. Uh, and, and also, it kind of clears up your thinking a lot uh, because you have to consider that what you're writing is not just an amalgamation of, of various voices and harmonies and whatnot. You have to clarify everything. You clarify your, your counterpoint. What is your baseline? What is your middle line? What is the harmony? What is, uh, what is this? What is that? And so that kind of really, I think it's, it could be, I'm not saying it is, but it could be a great way also towards composition and kind of making the, the composition transparent. Okay. I think, I think it's, it's a great thing to do, certainly. Um, I've been very practical in my arranging, meaning I haven't written too much music for the ensembles that I don't have at disposal. So, okay. like, if I had, like, uh, lots of symphonic orchestras that wanted to play my music, I would have written more symphonic music, but I haven't had. So I kind of, uh, I stuck with guitar, with uh, chamber music involving guitar, uh, with a lot of um, voice, voice with different chamber groups, because also I can, I really like writing for voice. Um, piano music, I've written a fair amount of piano music. So I'm primarily, 
I focused on chamber music. More chamber music, a few different concertos that I've written, they involve like symphonic orchestras and stuff, but not, not that much really. So um, I think orchestration, instrumentation, arranging, it's a, it's a great thing to do. I think it's all important uh, to stay in the domain of the practical. That's in my opinion, I think it's very important. And I think that maybe being a composer performer is another very practical thing because you have your instrument. In the worst case scenario, if nobody else wants to play your music, you can play your music. I mean, I know it seems kind of like pathetic, but actually it's very practical. It's very practical. And I mean, you think about, you know, the, these great composer performers like Chopin, you know, he could play his own music, you know, I'm sure he played some other stuff uh, apart from his music, but I think, uh, you know, it, it keeps you grounded. It keeps you grounded, keeps your music alive. It keeps your music accessible to the, pu to the public, to the audience. And I think if, if anything else I can say about the, the problems of 20th century music is that it got very much disconnected uh, there's a big disconnect between the composition and the audience. And I think that, um, I hope now we are in, in, in a period where this connection is becoming real again and where, where the, the audience can really uh, enjoy contemporary composition, where they can understand you know, what's going on. If not understand everything, where they can emotionally be engaged you know, and that, that's been, I think, big problem is that not only was there a, an intellectual disconnect, but also an emotional and physical disconnect. And so I think that that's, in my opinion, that's very important. And um, I think music has to be alive, it has to be living, and it's, it's meant for people. I mean, seems kind of obvious, but it's not that obvious. Yeah. Indeed. I think that uh, that is uh, some of the state, I mean, like now you touched, uh -huh. some of your statements are contained in uh, some of the books that you published in, I don't know, I remember, the, the one the fresher for me, it's the uh, Ex, Ex Ovo, which uh, I read like a couple of months ago. Uh, so it really gets connected to what you just said. And actually I wanted to ask you if you would like to mention to go deep because I think we are kind of closing the interview. Sure. Okay. Uh, if you wanted to mention the, some of your works, including principle of your aesthetic on, or uh, an article that you've wrote like for Soundboard or uh, other kind of magazines, uh, in which more than the actual music, we can also see what's the process behind in terms of building up your own being a musician because even I think the aspect of this connection between uh, music and music considered as a market object and so right. this division with the public and the return to a more direct connection between the performer and the listener it's something very um, concrete in the in, in that the we are debating a lot in the in the last mm -hmm. couple of years I think Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a it's a it's a difficult subject but yeah, yeah it is a difficult subject but um, as a personal experience I can talk perhaps the best about the personal experience um, yeah I think that um, for me uh, being musician was never really a label meaning I'm a musician, or uh, I don't know, I'm a master, or, or I'm a student either, you know. So actually, um, I never thought I was a student. I, I mean, I'm student always. I was student when I was, when I was learning about ancient Greek music, I was a student. But when I was a student, I didn't consider myself student. I was a uh, I was just this person interested in music, feeling passionate about it, playing guitar 10 hours a day, learning about Haydn quartets, being interested in all this. Uh, what I mean is there was no disconnect between me as a human being, me as a musician. You know, it's just something, uh, I would say it's something that you are. 
you know, being a musician for actually, I think most musicians are very, very much defined by being musicians. Maybe not everybody. There are people that are not very much defined. Some people want to just do their lessons. They go like twice, you know, two, three times a week. They do their lessons and then they just kind of go on vacation. But I think that, you know, nevertheless, we are kind of defined by music a lot. And um, um, so I would say that that has been a great challenge for me. You know, it's like, how do I combine all this? And... Um, I had a very developed career when I was younger. When I was, I mean, I, I had this this uh, big competitions that I won when I was in my early 20s, actually. I was 21, 22. And um, at some point, I just really didn't feel that a career was something that interested me anymore. Um, I just noticed that I was always repeating the same things. I was beginning to kind of uh, not be so interested. Um, you're just going from one hotel to another. Uh, I was losing a bit the sense. What what was the sense of all this? And so then I quit. I actually quit. And so <clears throat> that was in the in, in the moment when my career was very very developed as primarily as a guitarist. And then I came to this other ideas. You know why don't I try improvising a bit more? You know so I tried improvising more. Came back to to jazz African music. And so then since that time, everything else has been an integration, like, like, like a puzzle. Like, how do I put all this together? And that's what I tried to do. And um, I tried to give enough space, but also enough structure in my life in general, so that I can be alive and I can feel passionate about things. Uh, because, you know, as, as you know, it's very hard to stay passionate for, for years and years about, you know, some subject. I think it's just not it's just not easy to do, you know. And I think it's important to kind of create certain space for yourself. Um, and I thought that one of, one of the means of doing that was having fair amount of openness in what I do. So not just one thing. Or another. That's why the improvisation I felt was very important. Composition was important. Teaching also. I, I thought teaching was very important. Um, the business was somewhat important, but I have to admit that I slacked a bit in, in the business aspect. And um, probably if I did more business, I probably would have had a more successful career altogether. But then I'm not sure that I would necessarily like what I do. So that was my question with that. It's kind of like, yes, as long, because we, you know, we all have to do some amount of business. I mean, it's impossible not to do it. So I think as long as the business is not suffocating your creativity, I think it's okay. If your business is beginning to suffocate your creativity, you're becoming like a puppet of your own business. And I think there's a lot of people, I mean, I don't want to name anybody, but there are lots of people, they're kind of like a caricature of their own sort of uh, attempt to be super successful and, and whatnot. And I think that that's a big problem, in my opinion. It's a, for me, that was a big problem. Maybe it's not a big problem for everybody, but um, I think it's, it's kind of important uh, to know what you want to do today. You know, it's important to know what, what you want to do, the, to do today and not to lose the sight of, of your passion, really, of what you want to do with music. You know, I think it's very important not to lose that because otherwise it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, it's like a lost cause. And I think I tried to write about some of these things in, the, in, in this ex ovo in my book. Uh, there are some kind of very interesting books on this subject. There is uh, Theodore Adorno, who's written a lot about uh, uh, about uh, uh, sociology of music, about philosophy of music. Uh, there, there are also um, uh, there is Jacques Attali, who actually, kind of interestingly enough, he was he was president of the World Bank, but he's written a great uh, great uh, book on um, on economy of music. It's called Bruit the noise, 
It's called noise. Very, very, extremely interesting. So it gives like a whole other perspective on the development of the economy of music. So that's, you know, that's of course a whole other subject. But I think if I would cut this a bit shorter, I would say that it's really important to balance. Again, balance and integration, I think, is the key to everything. Um, and, and there is this problem of sort of a kind of putting the economy in front of everything else. You know, it's just, uh, you know, that seems to be a, a big problem, in my opinion. You know, so uh, how to integrate these things, how to balance it. There's no key to this. Um, I think everybody does it how they want. Somebody wants a big house. Somebody wants a Mercedes. Somebody doesn't care. Somebody wants to sit at home and play their, um, I don't know, uh, their um, Nino Rota. <laughs> or, you know, or a, an old Beatles song. Or somebody wants to do great concerts in Carnegie Hall. You know, we all want to do different things. So I think we just find our own balance. But as I mentioned, for me personally, um, that's been, it's been a challenge. It's been a challenge. And that's just how it is. So good luck. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> good luck. That's all I can say. I'm, I'm happy that we talked about this and uh, we'll just um, just hope that the, we get rid of the virus and that uh, soon enough yep. we'll, we'll, we'll go back to Volterra and, and eat Michele's great pasta. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Thank you so much. <laughs> Have a great day. Huh? Okay. Yeah, okay, see you. See you. See you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.